here at the Owned Cloud Society talk today. And I uh, just want to talk to you a little bit about uh, how you can expand access inside of cloud environments on engagements and then also like some mitigation steps for that. So um, I am Bryce Coons. Uh, I currently work at Adobe and I run the red team there at Adobe Digital Marketing Business Unit. Uh, they mostly focus on analytic type products or websites. And then uh, I used to work in the Department of Defense and I used to also work doing defense at Homeland Security. So, um, yeah. Right, so cloud, right? It's this nebulous term. And I, hopefully by the end of this talk, it won't seem so nebulous anymore. Uh, but it, it can get quite uh, uh, diverse quickly. You know, it seems like, you know, there's so much cloud now. You know, there's one cloud provider, then there's another cloud provider, and then there's another cloud provider. There's even more cloud providers. And I think the only thing that's really guaranteed is that there's always going to be another cloud provider coming out, right? So, soup of the day, right? So, while each cloud provider has differences, um, if you can learn the general security concerns at, with the setting up the infrastructure and running infrastructure in these cloud providers, um, then you'll just have to learn the little nuances that are different between the provider. And I know everyone talks about cloud, they talk about brand new, everything's different, all your old problems go away. Um, I'm of the perspective that a lot of things can be better, right, if applications are written around it. But I mean, uh, a lot of things are like the old stuff, like the way that we've been operating the data centers for decades now. So I just want to show you, this is kind of the old way, uh, just very simple and probably not even super accurate, but you got a developer, he writes code, he checks it into some repo, and then you have like some physical server, like a Jenkins box, and then that's going to push this code out to the production servers, whether that's like a web server or a uh, you know something doing batch processing of images or something like that. So you know that's I don't know maybe a standard build order for that's like a standard build order now for pushing code out to like a production data center you would own from end to end. And then you know you you pretty much have that same flow now in the cloud, but you're using services. So you're not managing the boxes and the services can expand up and down as needed to scale with your with your application, your product, your solution, all those things. So you know you could still have developers pushing code to GitHub or some other code repo and that's you know using some type of code deploy service, which then deploy that out to, you know, Lambda services in AWS, which are kind of like dynamic web servers or containers that get spun up when people request web services. And then you kind of have this storage in the cloud area of the S3 buckets for Amazon uh, where like persistent data is going to be stored, right? So, because, uh, you know, some of these services don't really have persistent storage. So, and these are all basically just APIs you're calling to interact with these various services. And then, you know, you, you still have admins, right? So in the old model, you'd have um, an admin. He might go, he might administrate like an AD box or an LDAP server. And then all the rest of the boxes in an enterprise more or less trust this AD or LDAP server. Um, so he's still able to get to all the servers and admin these various, you know, uh, individual servers across the data centers. And in the new cloud environments, you still have someone who has admin access. I mean, it might be the same developer, right, which is also developing the code, but instead of, you know, logging into servers, he's just logging into this web GUI management console, and from there, he's able to manage each of the services. So, so you know, you still, if you combine that developer and admin, maybe like a DevOps model with no separation of duties, then, you know, he's able to kind of go everywhere and touch everything, right? So obviously, you know, if this guy gets compromised, then, you know, that's a big, big concern. 
Let's just talk about, you know, this isn't just like figment of my imagination type scenario. I mean, this is actual intrusions that have happened and have bankrupted companies. So, um, the first thing is, <laughs> there's a there's a guy posting to Stack Overflow asking, I got a $50,000 AWS bill, what what should I do now, right? So, someone got a hold of uh, some of the secrets he was using to manage his Amazon services and just decided to spin up a bunch of uh, additional servers and uh, racked up a huge bill for him. So, you know, there is a, he was able to go through a resolution process with Amazon to get the bulk of the bill um, taken care of, but you know, this, if you're sloppy with your security, this could easily happen to you. And if you're running a very large amount of servers or leveraging a lot of those cloud services, you might even notice, you know, a fifty thousand dollar bond. Right? Okay, and then I think code spaces is the quintessential example of what not to do in the cloud space. So they built their entire um, web application in in Amazon. They backed it up to S3 buckets. Uh, they had AMIs, uh, images in Amazon, and an attacker uh, was able to compromise some API keys that they were using, and they emailed them and said, hey, you know, if you don't pay up, we're going to just destroy, you know, um, your company. They weren't really detailed on how they were going to do it, but uh, they didn't pay up, and uh, the attackers went in and they deleted all. And then they terminated all their running servers, their instances, and it essentially bankrupted the startup in one day, right? So, so I mean, this is like a real scenario that could happen, right? If you're not careful um, when you're, you know, doing a startup or something else in in a, in a cloud provider. Okay, so we're just going to talk about initial access. So, in the cloud providers. Um, there are secrets or API keys, and really you want to get your hands on these API keys. And there's many ways you can do that. I'm going to show you some pretty, um, I, I think they're amusing examples, right? Uh, but you know, you could take the traditional path of you know finding a vulnerability on a server and hacking that server, and finding the creds in the file, that kind of stuff too. So, so you know, the first thing is. People will actually mine through open source.
now, right? Um, to hack it, you know, really all you're going to do is like spin up a new Ubuntu box and then install the AWS tools. And um, I'll put a copy of these slides on SlideShare and I'll tweet out a uh, link to them afterwards. So um, that way you don't, you know, you're welcome to write it down or whatever, but you don't have to. But um, you're just, this is pretty standard if you admin um, AWS services, you'll probably already have these uh, tools installed. And uh, I'll just kind of show you how to use them. So S3 buckets, this is where you store files in Amazon. So you store like images, you store static content, maybe you back up files, um, maybe you created your own like OS image, then you upload it to S3, so then you could like launch it as, a, as an instance. So anytime you, know, you want persistent long-term storage, you, know, you might use an S3 bucket. Um, so some people actually host websites straight off of S3 buckets. And um, if they do that, you can actually just, you know, ping the domain, and you'll see in the response that comes back, like, hey, this is um, S3-website, and then it's going to give you the region that it, of it's uh, in Amazon it's actually located in, and you're just going to want to make note of that region information. Um, there's only so many regions, like, there's about 12 regions, right? So, I mean, you could, in future steps, just guess through 12 regions, but... You know, it's going to tell you what region it's located in. That's handy, right? Less guessing. So, uh, you know, that's not any crazy hacking, right? You just ping the domain and you saw it was hosted on S3. So, um, so S3 buckets can be set to be world readable, which just basically means, like, you ever go to a website and you see that index of, and it just gives you a listing of all the files that are there? I mean, you can set up your S3 bucket to be exactly like that. And so if that is the case, um, you can actually just use this uh, AWS S3 command and it will list back all the files that are available. And then you can try and download each file, see if you have permission to download it. And if you browse to something that's world, All right, so you got secrets, you got your box set up. Now you, you want to leverage those to actually do something useful inside of AWS. So the first thing I do is I configure profiles for secrets. Usually when I'm doing an engagement, I end up getting, especially as the engagement goes on, I get more and more secrets for AWS as I'm more and more successful. So I just try and set up different profiles with different names. Uh, that way I can switch between them easily and keep track of what what secrets I'm currently using. And so you just run that AWS configure command to do that. And then um, I usually just cat this, uh, there's a .aws folder inside the user's home directory. And uh, I usually just make sure it looks good before I start interacting. And I also sometimes remove the spaces around that equal sign just so I can do some bash scripting really quick when you do it. 
Um, okay, so this is kind of the who am I equivalent for for AWS. So you somehow got these secrets. You hacked a server, you found them in open source repositories, but you don't really know who these are, like who they belong to or what they do, or which services that they can access. So um, you can just use this STS get caller identification um, API call using command line tool, and it'll give you a little bit of information about whose secrets these are. And you can see these ones belong to a, like a user called backup, right? So. Um, another technique for finding out more information about who you are is by calling IAM. IAM is the user management capability and secret management capability inside of AWS. So um, you may or may not have access to it. I mean, realistically, you should not probably ever get access to that just off something this trivial. But um, you know, even if it doesn't work, it'll err, and in the air, it'll tell you a little bit of information about the user you're currently running as. So. Um, so once you know that the creds work, right, once you do that STS uh, identification call, um, you, my first thing I want to do is know, am I being logged, right? Because if I'm being logged, I need to be very cautious about every API command that I issue, um, you know, lest I get caught, right, before the engagement is over. So um, if the most...
we shut some logging off, so uh, we're not being recorded. We found the secret, either through hacking a server, through some open source repository. But now we just want to make sure we don't get kicked out, right? It's like I got two weeks left on this engagement. I just want to make sure that I don't get kicked out or detected before it's over, so that way I can, you know, provide back a holistic picture to the customer of what's occurring here in this environment. So I think this is a cool technique. Um, you can actually, if you have an API, um, if you have a secret token that's used for like API access, you can actually get a session token. Uh, you can say, hey, get session token, and this will give you a completely different set of secrets that uh, are good for 12 hours. So then you just set up a cron job that gets a secret every 12, like less than that, right? So like every 10 hours. And as long as you know this secret, this session secret continues to work, then the, you'll continue to get more and more session secrets. So there's like some little nuances uh, that that may get annoying with using this, like a little bit more difficult to set up, and uh, there is some some nuanced restrictions in AWS that you can't do that the main secret can. But um, but the session secrets, um, it, I don't know really how to view them inside of AWS, and I'm not really 100% sure they are viewable, so um, maybe there's a way to enumerate that now, but um, I'm not really aware of it, so. Yeah, go ahead. The default is 12. I think you can go up to 16, right, on your on your issuance of it. Um, I just did the default. You can actually, there's another switch that lets you specify the time that it's good for. Um, and there's documentation on it. So you, you could go larger, I just didn't want to, like if there was a way to enumerate session tokens, which I'm not sure there is, um, I just didn't want to stand out from anybody else's session tokens, right? So, um, right, so I think this is pretty stealthy. Um, and then you just kind of set it up in the AWS file, similar to the way you set up the previous secrets, um, but just some of the names are slightly different. And then from then on, you know, you use that session token profile, and then you can keep interacting with the services, um, you know, for the foreseeable future. Um, another way to persist is every user that's in the console can have two AWS secrets associated with their account. So most users will just issue one API secret and then they'll continue to use that for most of their operations. And if they need something that's more application specific, they'll create another account that's just specific for that API call. So you can actually just go through, list out all the users if you have IAM access, and then pick a user that you think is a good candidate, and then add another session, another secret to that user. And then by adding that secret to the user, um, you know, hopefully that'll go unnoticed by the user. Um, it's not super apparent in the web theory. I mean, if the user goes in, they'll probably just think they issued it previously and then revoke it. Um, you could also just straight up add another user, right, using the um, console tool. Here I'm adding the user, M. Ryan. My favorite actor. Um, Okay, let's see. Oh yeah, so you add, the, you add a user, then you can add a key to the user, then you can add a password to the user. In this scenario, then you can actually log to that pretty web GUI. Although there's really no reason you need to as an attacker. You can do everything you need to from the command line. So. All right, cool. So, if you can, if you have access, if that secret has access to S3 buckets, then usually what I'll do is I'll dive into the S3 buckets and I'll try and find more secrets, right? You can find more secrets that have access to IAM, which is like user management, or have access to EC2, which is instant management, like lets you spin up new servers in the cloud. Then you can actually just spin up a brand new server inside their, their VPC, which is like their private network, and then you can just SSH into your own server that's now running inside of their, their environment, and then you can do all your classic um, you know, pen testing techniques from that server, right? So why why is this better, right? Because, you know, one, you have full control of that server that's inside their private network now. You can do any type of tool installation that you want. 
Two, you can now access probably a lot more services that are accessible. Just like if you were to get access to a server inside a data center, you can now start scanning up and probably find like unauthenticated Redis databases or, or other like memcache servers, um, things like that. A whole wide range of services which the ACL groups from the security groups from the internet are probably denying. But once you're inside that trusted VPC, inside that trusted network, you can now start just hacking more and more servers, right? And of course, when you hack another server, you definitely go and try and mine through it to find more secrets, right? So you kind of go full loop, right? You're doing traditional friend testing, you're doing AWS interactions, and then you're just kind of using each other to feed each other in a continuous loop. And, um, uh, you know, this will like appear like a new instance is in their list. So, I mean, you probably want to list the instances first and make sure there's a bunch in this region. I mean, if there's like, you know, you, you know, if there's 20 plus servers in a region and you spin up one more, I, I don't know, it seems like low likelihood someone's going to attack it. But. Uh, some, of, some of the AWS accounts have seen just have you know, hundreds of instances, right? So. And then I just want to talk about the metadata service. Um, I know this, uh, you know, been talked about before, but uh, something that I often run into people and they are unaware of. So there's actually an RFC that just basically says for these cloud providers, there's a magic IP address. There's 169 IP address. And based off the RFC, you should be able to query this IP address only from an instance that's running inside the cloud provider and then get back information about the instance. So uh, this is crucial for a few reasons. Like, one, if you ever get code execution on an instance inside of uh, AWS, you definitely want to query the metadata service and enumerate as much information as you can out of it. You could basically just do that by making curl requests, right, to the metadata service. Two, some types of web vulnerabilities, if they are occurring on an instance in, in Amazon, are, are need to be, have their criticality moved up, right? So if you can, you know, do kind of like an open redirect on a web application to get a web application to make a call out to an I, another IP address on its internal network and then return that result back to you, you can actually have it reach out and go to this 169 IP address and then return back the result of the metadata service to yourself. Um, very infrequently, but it is possible, you could find secrets actually stored like the metadata service would return you back secrets. So um, that shouldn't happen, but um, um, there is like some configuration data that can go into instances when you boot them up, and uh, sometimes uh, that data can be retrieved through the metadata service. Um, and it really, to see if the metadata service is available from any instance, you just um, curl the 169 IP address, and then you gotta do the right uh, URI. And then if that works, then you want to go back to the documentation and get a full list of all the URIs and they kind of enumerate for each one of those, pull back all the information. It's a relatively easy. But, um, but like I said before, um, metadata service is, is actually not an Amazon thing. There's like an RFC um, and more cloud providers like um, Azure and DigitalOcean and uh, Google Compute has one too, um, are actually trying to build a similar type service. So if you get code execution on any of those providers, you should be able to query that same 169 IP address um, and then also gain some information about the instance. So um, the problem is Amazon's implementation of it is much more mature than the other cloud providers for my testing. Um, Google's has a little bit of additional protections. You have to specify like a particular host banner when you're querying it, so that might alleviate some of those web redirect issues. Um, like you wouldn't be able to do it through them, but uh, but uh, yeah, it, in Azure you can query these two API calls. These are the only two that I was able to find, um, and it gives you back some really limited data. It's not really useful. But what is cool in Azure is um, there's a W agent folder, and in Linux, it's under var lib w agent. And if you go into this directory, you can get a lot of information about the instance and possibly even secrets to access additional 
resources inside of Azure. So um, you do have to be a root on the instance to do this inside of Azure. So that's a little bit better than the Amazon setup. But um, there's definitely some uh, juicy data to mine through there. Okay, cool. So, so we got access to someone's AWS. Uh, now we want to expand access, right? If we um, if we have IAM, you know, obviously we probably just add ourselves a user, log into the web GUI, which would be cool there. Um, but you know, a lot of times, what customers they're like, okay, great, you got access to that, but like, where's like, where's the credit card? Like, where's the production data? How do you, you know? How would you go from that to to actually like our critical data, right? So um, you can take snapshots of your servers inside of AWS, and if they've done this previous, and you're able to spin up an EC2 image, you can actually just mount those snapshots as another hard drive. If you mount them as a hard drive, then you can start mining through them for like you know uh, SSH private keys, and if you find SSH private keys, and you're inside that VPC, then you can start SSHing to other boxes using the private keys you pulled off these snapshots. So you know you got to be thinking. Every, all this comes back to, you know, physical file, you know, files on disk. Um, can I mount those? Can I read them? And if so, can I find more secrets or can I, you know, use those to access the boxes? Or access boxes, so we share before. Um, and uh, so I just want to talk about a pretty extreme technique. I, I do not recommend this unless you're in a pretty desperate scenario, but uh, it is very effective, right? So I call this the uh, hard, <laughs> hard boot technique, right? So let's just say there's a server in EC2. You, you've you got root credentials to AWS, but you still can't get inside the server, right? So it's spun up using some uh, SSH private key that you, you don't have access to, right? And those aren't like retrievable inside of the AWS service. Um, one thing you could do, although, you know, obviously this is uh, going to affect production, is uh, you can actually just, because you have access to managed instances, you can say, hey, shut down this server. When the server shuts down, you can actually mount the server's hard drive from another EC2 instance. Then you can actually modify that other, the other production server's hard drive, like add your SSH key to the remote, to that server's hard drive instance, and then unmount it, and then spin back up the server, right? You know, obviously, this is going to make some sysadmins very angry if you're spinning down their production servers. But I mean, unless they're implementing some type of full disk encryption at, at the like inside the instance at the cloud provider, which I've never been done yet, which probably should do to solve this type of thing. Um, the right, you're going to be able to now SSH into the production server and pretty much access anything you want there, right? So. Um, or you know you could have pulled it off when you had the image, right? But relatively, you know, you probably want to keep the time that the server's off to the lowest amount possible to not be detected, right? So yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, can you create a snapshot so that you don't have to do a hard boot, right? So um, I think my experience with that is you can't create snapshots until the server is shut down. Um, and then um, so you'd have to do a hard boot to do a snapshot. But a good technique is to go through AM. Another technique, I don't know if I explicitly talked about it or not, is actually a lot of people will create AMIs, right? And you can actually share AMIs to another Amazon account. So as an attacker, you just sign up for another Amazon account, and you can actually go into their images and share their instance images with you. And sometimes the image will have, you know, secrets or creds or keys stored in it, and that will allow you to, you know, access that type of data, um, which would be another technique. Although a lot of times what I see cloud providers doing is the, the AMI just has a bootstrap script, and the bootstrap script reaches out to like a salt or a puppet server, and then the pup, salt and puppet server kind of push all the secrets onto it at that point. So 
Um, you know, sharing the AMIs hasn't worked great for me, but um, you know, it's definitely a technique. So. Okay, so I'm just going to talk about mitigations for a second, and then I'm going to take questions. So. Um, Right, so, you know, the biggest thing for me is just single purpose secrets, right? So, if you want a secret to access RDS, the relational database, a secret using the root account that's tied to the root account. You want to create another account and then log in with other account and then create secrets associated with the other account at a bare minimum. Um, reasons that you want to do this. Like one, root secrets generally have access to do everything inside your Amazon instance, so if those get compromised, they can do anything. Um, another tidbit about root secrets is there's a technique where you can actually use root secrets to buy stuff off Amazon.com and bill it back to the root secrets credit card number. So, I mean, I haven't actually seen it, like an attacker do that, but, you know, uh, if they don't like just wasting your money on AWS, they could actually physically ship themselves stuff with it. So. Um, and then the other thing is rotating secrets very frequently, right? Um, these are not things that, you know, you want to be static and left there forever. Like I said, it's not if it gets compromised, it's when it's going to get compromised, and when that happens, how quick can I roll the keys? and you know, how, how long were those keys good for. And then another really big thing, and there's a lot of solutions now to actually do this, um, if you're using, uh, you know, Puppet, like a black box type solution will allow you to do this, and um, um, is secret management, right? You don't want your secrets sitting in plain text inside of your code repo, like Git, and that's the end. So you need to come up with some type of software that's gonna have encrypted blobs inside there, and those get decrypted on the production servers. Because, um, yeah, you know, developers uh, you know, will eventually make a mistake, or, you know, so we'll get access to the code repo that's not supposed to, and if that has access to production secrets, then, they, you know, the entire production environment could be compromised. Okay, that's... That is the presentation. So thanks for coming out. If does anyone have questions? Okay, I'll be up here if you guys have questions or concerns, or if you want to throw stones at me. It's totally cool. Um, thanks for coming out. I appreciate it.